Lars, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, maybe we can start with a quick intro. Um, do you want to go first? Sure. And thanks for having me here. My name is uh, Lars Peterson. I'm co-founder of Uniform. And in Uniform, we focus on personalization and making it super fast so it can run on a Mac architecture and uh, also deliver great performance that is important in terms of the Google Lighthouse score. Thanks, Lars. Um, my name is Nishant Patel. I am the CTO uh, at Content Stack. Um, we uh, you know, help uh, digital brands manage the content and deliver the content across various channels. Um, Lars, thanks for being here. Um, let's jump right into it. Um, you know, we hear a lot about personalization. Uh, what exactly is it and why should companies uh, care about it? Yeah. Um, I think personalization has been something that has been high on the agenda for the past 10 years. And it's with a good reason because those organizations that use personalization, according to research, on average sees a 19% higher conversion rate. So it means that by delivering a personalized experience, you deliver something that is much more engaging for the visitors based on their different intent. That means that they engage more with content, with the different products, services you have on the site, and then more, more of them will uh, end up converting to, um, to your different uh, goals. So if it's a um, business to business where you are focusing on leads, that could be 19% more leads generated by using personalization. If it's a shop commerce selling products, it could be 19% more uh, products being uh, sold. So. Um, that's a really, really good business case for uh, for personalization. Yeah, no, it sounds interesting. And, and like you said, it's been around for a long time. Um, but now, you know, we hear a lot about the mock kind of architecture. Uh, and there's a lot of companies that have kind of gone down that path. Um, in terms of personalization, what are the considerations uh, from an architecture perspective if you want to, you know, bring personalization into the mix? Uh, you know, how would you get started on, on that journey? Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good question. And, and, and actually, if we look at the um, different approaches and also uh, Mark, um, how that is a little bit uh, different. So, so at one end, the business case for personalization is really, really good. Um, as just mentioned, you, you can get 19% more conversion, which is very appealing to many brands. But uh, personalization has also been a little bit of that promised land that many brands haven't really been able to get to yet. And, um, and the reason for that is it, it has been super complex. Um, it has been super complex in terms of the technologies you need to have in place in order to get started with personalization. Um, so a couple of the approaches um, that, that basically has been out there has been on one end, you have the suite approach where you invest in a suite and the suite comes with different capabilities. You get content management, you get analytics, you get personalization. Then you also have more the uh, third party origin uh, based personalization that is embedded client side into your site. But basically all the personalization is running um, a third party from an, from an origin there. So if you go with the suite approach and some of the um, complexities in getting started with personalization has been, first, you need to follow step one, two, three of getting the suite up and running. And then if you're not ran out of budget and, uh, and everything is set up uh, correctly according to the paradigms of the suite, then you may continue with the personalization. Um, most unfortunately have no more budget left. Uh, they might have taken uh, some shortcut as part of their, uh, of their implementation. So now it's not longer possible to run personalization on those different components where they wish to uh, run uh, uh, personalization based on. Um, we, we see the third party uh, client side personalization has been more in the lead for the last couple of years. That is definitely changing now where performance is becoming critical. Because if you add in anything that is third party that adds a load to your site, that will impact the uh, core web vitals. So, um, so, so that also gets a little bit uh, complicated. So where Mac comes into play is really, uh, Mac is all focused on, uh, as in its name, microservices, API, cloud, headless. 
So it means that it's, it's multiple headless technologies that are connecting together in a Mac uh, architecture. So that means that the bloat from the suite approach uh, is gone because you're working with smaller best of breed technologies that is really, really good at the specific capabilities like content stack for content management. You have a CDN that is focused on providing the uh, fastest uh, load for, um, for any site or app and deliver that globally to, uh, to visitors. So, uh, so, so Mac changes those things uniform uh, and we also part of the um, Mac Alliance. We play very well with these other uh, technologies. So that means that we fit into that architectural blueprint and, and essentially you can plug us in early in the project. You can plug us in mid or after uh, the initial project but we don't dictate and come with uh, certain paradigms on how you have to build your site, making it much more easy to get started with. And then it's also a decoupler approach. So, um, so it's also built for performance instead of uh, having in a third party uh, script that basically um, needs to call an origin uh, uniform and, and decoupled personalization that is Mac based ships with your app or your site. So it's all uh, decoupled, um, which is um, a really strong uh, parameter. So, so from an architectural point of view, um, that, that is super important. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, right? So um, like you said, there's the, kind of the two approaches. You have the, the suite approach, and then you kind of have the mock approach. Uh, Lars, can you, um, for, the, for the folks that actually have the suites, uh, can you implement Uniform uh, with that as well? It's a, it's a different approach with the, uh, with the suites and, and that um, uh, is dictated by how the suite works because typically in the suite, you, um, you work with personalization, you work with a rule-based engine there. So, so while you would be able to connect some parts of uniform from the outside, in most cases, you, you want to um, uh, still keep the suite capabilities to do it if you have invested in a suite, but now you are getting into issues with performance and, uh, and, and has the solution been built up correctly in order to support the uh, personalization of the uh, suite. Um, we do have some um, where we more serve as, as, a, a, as a bridge between having a legacy system and then having a modern system. So it's also easier to uh, embrace more uh, modern technology and take a step into the uh, Mac architectural uh, uh, world yeah no that's that's very interesting right because um like you said um the suite kind of comes with it's all kind of packaged in one and and, yeah. and and you you mentioned there's like step one two three and people are just busy with step one two and you know they never get to the three which is kind of the cherry on top with with personalization and all these things that will kind of give you a lot of business value, 19% conversion rate, but you never get to that, right? Um, so this mock approach sounds pretty interesting, uh, but for, for the architects out there, right? So let's say um, you, uh, you go down the mock architecture, uh, you get your website or e-commerce uh, site deployed. Uh, what would you recommend to, to get to personalization? Like what would, what, how would you sort of recommend companies to, you know, start with personalization and then kind of do a little bit more and then a little bit more and then kind of get to the advanced stage? Like, well, what's your recommendation there? And, and, and again, personalization is still early on, even though that it, it has been around for 10 years, because it has been that complex of actually using, not that many organizations have a good experience in, in using personalization yet. They all know that it makes sense, right? Uh, offering someone who is interested in a specific product, more of that product and more content around that product makes uh, sense. So it's more the mechanics of, of how you actually get to um, uh, start it. So, so where do you start? Um, a good rule of thumb is really start with your customers. Um, understand those customers or visitors coming to your site or using your app. Why are they coming? Because they are not coming there by accident. Like, uh, it's not like a lot of us will, okay, I have five minutes. Let me just uh, go to a random uh, site and, and look around. We all come because we have a specific intent. So the key in uh, starting with personalization is understanding what are the intents that most visitors on your website actually have. And then um, get that narrowed down to what are the 
top three, top five most intents that most visitors have on the site that can also help you deliver most business value um, if you um, personalize for, uh, for that specific uh, intents. So, so now that you begin to understand that um, and a good source of information is obviously looking at existing analytics, uh, existing data you have around usage on your site or your app, um, then begin to, to take a, almost like a mystery shopper approach to understanding what, what is the experience that you are currently delivering to visitors that have a specific intent. Um, so that will be a little bit of walking in the shoes of your customers, like start where they are coming from. If they are coming from search, what are they searching for? What is the main landing page? How does the experience unfold when they start navigating to the homepage, category pages? It is, is that relevant based on coming from a very specific uh, intent? And then start mapping out what would actually be a relevant experience based on those top three, top five uh, different intents. And then uh, start mapping out what content is needed to essentially um, personalize that experience. But um, a, a good approach is also um, uh, adding that in a roadmap that is a little bit of a crawl, walk, run, uh, fly. So you're, you're not trying to do too much uh, too soon, but you're really trying to give a better experience for those visitors that have specific intents that you have most visitors uh, of. And then you go into tactics. You have different tactics when you're on the crawl phase, when you're on the run phase and, and so forth. Makes sense. Um, I think uh, to start out with the intent and in terms of the use cases, right? Like what, let's say you pick the use case, like how does uniform particularly get embedded into the mock? So, so like, let's get a little bit more technical in terms of yeah. uh, do I, is there like a lot of setup required or is it just kind of, you know, you inject uniform in there? Like how does it all kind of work? Yeah, it's, um, and, and a little bit of background actually, we wanted to kill the rules engine so badly because the, uh, the rules engine where someone is setting up, like if you match this and not that and this or else, and then show this content, that is way too complex for, uh, for many organizations because the dynamics change all the time. That mm. means that the dynamics, which you typically will create rules based on will change. You get new content you do new uh, marketing campaigns. So, so it's always changing. And if you have to um, update your rules and you have to update them on all the uh, different pages where you have rules, then you basically end up using all your time on, uh, on creating rules and updating rules. And that's, that's not a fun uh, experience going to work every day. And then for the next uh, eight, nine hours, you are just updating rules, right? So we wanted to kill that. So the way um, Uniform works and the paradigms we uh, develop is that our main focus is to understand what is the intent of a visitor based on their in the moment uh, behavior. So, um, so Uniform lets you create these different intents. So for instance, it could be, um, let's say we have a conference site and on that conference site, you have visitors that have the intent to watch developer talks and then you have visitors that have the intent to watch marketing talks. So mm -hmm. those are two big intents. And now we want to identify how does the visitor actually have those intents. And we do that by um, what we call signals. So a signal could be, uh, for instance, behavior. So if you um, consume content about a developer talk, that gives you behavior towards the uh, developer intent. If you come from a marketing campaign that really has been focusing on uh, what's developer talks, that is also a signal to the uh, developer intent. So essentially an intent is made up by multiple signals that can be behavior, could be uh, different events you're doing on the website, but it can also be um, connecting it with your marketing activities. So uh, emails bringing traffic to the site, uh, um, PPC, bringing traffic to the site, all of that, all with the purpose of trying to match you in real time. Ah, this visitor fits this intent. And then the intent essentially is what triggering what is the relevant uh, content to show that is being uh, synced up with the uh, content management system. So, um, so as a content author working with 
content, um, I don't need to leave my CMS. I can simply just um, create content and tag it. This content is relevant for developers. And now um, it's able to, uh, to basically match the visitor intent with the content that is most relevant for, uh, for developers uh, there. So, um, so how, it, how it works more from a technical point of view is you, um, we, we assess a platform. So you log into Uniform, you, you um, set up your intents, you set up your different signals, you connect it with the other systems that you work uh, with. So for instance, if, um, if you're working with content stack, then you put in the API keys. And when you go to content stack and you work with content, you will get uh, the different intents embedded uh, as part of the uh, content you are creating. Now, when you um, publish your site on app or changes, Uniform um, comes with a manifest that essentially is, what are the intents? What are the different signals that ships with your app and your site to a CDN of choice? So that means that you don't call us every single time you have a visitor to trying to understand, do we hit this signal and match this intent and back and forward because that's too much latency. It simply ships with the uh, app. And then we come with a decoupled tracker that uh, keeps track of everything that the visitor is doing and, and, uh, and calculating what is the intent that you match the most. And that will then uh, get the, um, the content that needs to be shown. Um, and that content could be any content. It could be, um, hero, but it could also be a list. Um, for instance, if you have a list of, in this case, could be talks at the conference, then it will sort that list uh, based on the um, in the moment intent. And, uh, and, and it could also be that you have both marketer and developer preferences. So, uh, so now it will take those uh, sessions that, that is for both uh, audiences there as the uh, first priority. So, um, so there's a lot of, um, math going on to, uh, to basically uh, showcase the right experience. But from a marketer or practitioner point of view, it's made super simple because you just have to think about intents, signals, and then that gets uh, connected into the different systems you are using, the content management system, the commerce um, system you're using for, uh, for products and list and all of that uh, within that. And then uniform ships with all of that and, and really uh, focus on fast execution on the edge. Yeah, this is, this is interesting, uh, Laura. So you, you talked about uh, the, you know, the personalization that was done, it was mostly rule-based rule and, and having the marketer, the, the, the practitioner, having to maintain that on a regular basis was, uh, it's just not practical. And maybe that was uh, a big sort of, um, reason why the adoption hasn't been and and what uh, uniform is doing is is quite different um you know with the intent and the signals once th those are set uh it seems like it, it's automatically kind of figures out and, and 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 you know dynamically keeps uh changing the rules if you if you will um yeah 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 it's it's more about um it's to kill the rules and then to, to, uh, to bring that logic so you don't have to think about it. The only, only thing you have to consider is just um, creating your intents. And then when you create content associated with the different intents and content can be in, in different content models, like you create heroes, uh, mm -hmm. heroes for the homepage, and then you can create X number of variants of that hero um, knowing that this is the one you show for developers, this is the one you show for marketers, this is the one you show if you match uh, both and, uh, and so forth. And then Uniform will automatically um, showcase those, track it, and, um, and also understand what is the delta of personalization versus the uh, default uh, component. So you can see what is working, what is not working, and then you can use that to refine and do more personalization based on data. That's awesome. And I think um, the other thing I would just kind of mention is uh, this, this whole mock approach, right? Um, uh, based on what Uniform is providing and for, for companies or architects that are kind of on the mock, um, they can take some simple use cases, right? Uh, like you said, like just the crawl, crawl, crawl approach. Uh, Uniform is a hosted sort of system. 
um, you you plug it in where the content is. It could be content stack or wherever. Uh, you bring Uniform in, uh, take a couple of these use cases and, and and give it a try. It doesn't take much, right? Uh, from a setup perspective, from uh, just em embedding it, it doesn't take much, right? Um, to to yeah. get it in. Yeah, it's it's um, if you look at it from a crawl, walk, run, uh, fly approach, then it it doesn't take much. Uh, essentially, you can be up and running with. Um, site connected to content stack uniform with, um, uh, for instance, the next Gatsby on a CDN of choice in less than 10 minutes. So it's pretty easy to, to get a starter site uh, up and running. And then if you, I, I think one of the other things that have been complicated about personalization is really that, where do we start, right? What's the, um, what's mm -hmm. the first step? And many <clears throat> um, have been too focused on the first step being where we have data around the customers. And, and typically, if you think about where we have data around the customer, that is in some storage, it's in a CRM, uh, things like that. Um, but that also complicates what are the tactics you can use because if you think about all traffic on your site, it's really a, a funnel. You have uh, someone coming into your site um, and now hopefully most of them um, continue to consume content, but you'll have someone that will bounce uh, based on that uh, first site, uh, first page that they land on. Um, so, so, so that's a good opportunity to engage them as well. And then next step in the funnel is really um, what are they doing based on behavior? Um, first step, second step, that's all anonymous traffic. So, uh, so this is where the signal really starts kicking in and you get a better classification of what is their intent. And then at the end of the funnel, that's where you begin to have some uh, specific customer data. But if you are just focusing on the end for personalization, you're missing out on all the, um, uh, all the other parts of the funnel where you really have a good opportunity to convert those different visitors to the next step, to the next step, and then hopefully to, um, to do some transactional, like exchanging data with, um, with your company. So, so part of crawl is also uh, laying out that funnel and then, um, and, and then evaluate from the organization, what are we actually doing that drives traffic to the uh, site? How much is organic? How much is something we own? Um, and typical, what companies own are more focused on billboard, uh, display advertising, PPC, email. How do we, how do we um, run those different campaigns? What are the tags we are using? Many use UTM tags for understanding campaign source, all of that. And those are super simple to connect um, as a signal. We already have uh, support for that. So, uh, so a good uh, crawl tactic, once you have it up and running, might be start connecting your marketing campaign. So if you know you are promoting a specific service, product, um, call to action, then all the different components on the site uh, on key pages can now change. So it's relevant to whatever brought the uh, visitor in. So you keep that, that initial intent. They clicked on a certain campaign because they have interest in that. And then throughout their engagement on their visit, you bring it back um, to that uh, campaign, to that call to action and getting them to move forward against what is most relevant for them based on the inbound intent. It's interesting. So you, you, this, this thing, the way you kind of presented it is the anonymous traffic. There's a lot of opportunities on top of that funnel. Cause, cause uh, like, like you said, a lot of people kind of get down into kind of the, the bottom where you're saying, oh, well, I have so much data, but that data is, um, you're missing out on all that anonymous traffic where, you, where there's a lot of opportunities in terms of conversion, uh, could yeah. be done. And, and it's, it's kind of a simpler, to probably start there because um, you know you can plug it into your uh, existing campaigns is what, what the, the way you kind of describe it, right? So, yeah, and then, and most likely that's that's nine, 95 plus percent of all the traffic you have on your website is anonymous. So the um, the quicker you can start doing anonymous personalization, um, that's a good starting point because now personalization is really focused on driving more engagement consuming more content, interacting more with the site or the app. And then by doing so, you engage them and then 
you are driving more conversions and um, and know who uh, who the visitors are uh, as well. Makes sense. Which, which is also uh, good for uh, for privacy, um, because with GDPR and the CPA, um, uh, all that legislation that is that is coming um, and is in effect already. You also have the choices when you do this more based on the Mac architecture. So you can be a um, good corporate citizen and, and, then, um, and then let your users own their data. You actually don't need to, uh, to store that um, because personalization can key off the data that is on their devices. So, uh, so uh, obviously you have choices. You can choose to store, store it or not, uh, but you can go to the extreme where you actually offer full personalization that is relevant based on the intents that the different visitors is having without having the data leave their different devices. So you're borrowing it on the client to personalize the experience. And, um, and that's a good thing, having those choices. So you're not per default uh, collecting all data. And now you get into issues with different legislations about why you're storing this data, what's the purpose for how long, uh, all of that, that gets complex when you have these different legislations in place. Is this, uh, Lars, is that the stuff that you're talking about in terms of uh, like the, the latency, like, you know, you don't have to come back to the origin uh, to, to figure out, um, you know, what, did, what should be presented. Um, like with Uniforms technology, it's mostly um, th this app or, or um, maybe an SDK or something that runs on the client. Is that, can you explain yeah. that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah uh, it definitely, because mo most, um, personalization engine, um, which more took off uh, 10 years ago, right? They are origin-based because they, they store data about the uh, visitor based on their origin. And now in order to understand what data or what content to show the visitor, they will call an origin. And the origin is, is a database somewhere, right? You might, have, you might have your data center in North America, you might have one in Europe, you might have one in Asia. So it will query the um, data center that is closest to the visitor. So if I'm, um, for instance, coming from Australia and my data center is in Asia, there's a latency going to that data center to get the response back because we know all of these uh, information about Lars. Lars should see hero uh, B uh, based on that. But just going to that uh, data center could cost you 300 milliseconds, 800 milliseconds, and that's, that's a big latency to add in, especially as part of um, Core Web Vitals, where uh, largest contentful paint gets super, super important. And in order to get a good score there, you should be under two and a half uh, seconds. If you want to have a perfect score, you should be under 1.8 seconds. So, so all of a sudden, those 300, 400, 800 milliseconds, you add uh, to it by calling um, an uh, origin, um, really, really hurt your chances of getting a good or a perfect uh, score in a largest consentful paint. So what, mm -hmm. what, what we are doing is essentially, it's decoupled. Uh, we use edge technology from the CDN. So that means that you have visitor coming to your site or using your app. And now uh, everything is computed on the edge. So that means that, that we know that because you have this behavior, you're showing these different signals towards a specific intent, you should see hero B. And, and that, that is something that is uh, computed in less than 50 milliseconds. So now all of a sudden, your chances of getting a perfect um, score in your core web vitals, uh, largest contentful paint, is through the roof, right? Um, obviously, you don't need to have a two megabyte uh, picture in the hero or things <laughs> like that, that will hurt it. But your foundation of getting uh, absolutely a perfect score in core web vitals is there. And, um, and from a privacy point of view, it's also there because we are not just uh, harvesting uh, across different countries and, and making the legislation super hard. Yeah, no, it, it's extremely important on the core uh, vital stuff uh, because a lot of the ranking now is, is based on that. And, um, and uh, every little bit kind of helps. Um, and you said 15 milliseconds, uh, which, which is awesome. Um, and, and, you know, I'm seeing a lot of stuff now uh, happening at the edge. A lot of these calculations kind of help, helping at the edge. And it seems like you guys have uh, utilized that. 
and, and uh, you know, with, with your offering, which is, which is great. Um, so, yeah, so uh, yeah, go ahead, Laura, sorry. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to that, um, it's also it's agnostic, uh, which actually is, is pretty cool. So, um, so it's not dictating a certain CDN you have to use. Um, it could be you're using Netlify, could also be you're using Akamai or Cloudflare or Vassil. And mm -hmm. then um, we, we, we plug in to those different uh, CDNs and make it uh, possible to run on those different CDNs as well. That's awesome. Cool. I, um, one last thing, Lars, in terms of personalization, you said even though it's been around for 10 years, um, the adoption is to be there, I guess, uh, you know, a uh, company like yours is using a lot of the latest technologies and, and uh, helping people kind of adopt uh, personalization with the mock architecture. What do you see in the next uh, few years uh, in, in, in and around personalization? Yeah, it's, I, I think because the barrier to, to entrance is being lowered. Um, I mean, we, we have a, you can set up Uniform quickly. We have a free account. So, so all those complexities are around how to actually get started and, and, and having to follow certain paradigms is making it super easy. So, um, so, so obviously we're already seeing um, more adoption now. Um, and, then, and then this headless uh, focus, uh, especially with, uh, with Mac as well, is also a driving uh, force because the, the systems are easier to connect. And, and the more the systems can connect between them, the more you empower the, um, the different users that actually use those different systems. So, so for instance, when you think about uh, headless CMS, you have content creators, content authors, um, uh, content strategies that, that works with, um, with that. If they would have to go somewhere else to set up personalization, that's a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, if developers are not able to get perfect Lighthouse score, that's a barrier. And then they will rip it out because they need to get under that 1.8 second on largest contentful paint. So, so all of the sudden uh, using Mac architecture, we're removing all those different uh, barriers and we are bringing it in to those uh, different roles that is the best fit for working with personalization. So now content authors, super easy. They don't need to uh, have a PhD in analytics or how to set up rules. They can do it at the same time as they are creating uh, content. Developers, mm -hmm. it's not a barrier. In fact, they can use the intent context that we, um, that we create on the edge to also do uh, cool things to other parts of what they're developing. If they are creating a list component, things like that, then they can use that context to sort the list, list component. And, and they also get empowered in, um, as part of their work. So, so because we don't see those different frictions between developers, marketers, uh, content authors, it's really, really easy uh, to get started. And then of course, the more uh, guidance around process, where to start, um, here's your step one, two, three, in order to get started with personalization, also make it easier, uh, which is something that, that we also focusing on in, in Uniform. So for instance, um, one of the things we have for onboarding our customers is a board game where we can um, uh, walk those customers through the journey on selecting their top intents and mapping out what content should be most relevant for, uh, for those visitors based on the, um, the uh, top intents there. So, um, and still the business case is the driving force, right? Because personalization, we all consumers. So we all know a bad experience. We go to a site, we sign up for the newsletter. We go back, it says sign up for the newsletter. We buy something uh, on another site and we go back and it says buy this now, right? It's terrible experiences. And that is really what personalization is, is helping with. And the better experiences that brands are able to deliver for their customers, the better um, experience and, uh, and, and brand belonging that will be for, um, for, the, um, for the customers and, and the brand. And that's super important because we all have choices and the better you are able to build that preferences for, for your customers, the more business you will uh, earn in the future. Yep, nicely said. It's it's all about the experience and uh, personalization. Had a lot of promises for a long time, uh, but it seems like sort of this this new architecture and and uh, ease of use 
is going to help with the adoption, eventually leading to a better experience. Um, cool. Uh, this is awesome, Lars. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for joining us uh, in this conversation. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks so much for, for having me. And um, I would also call out um, as one last thing here, um, what really makes personalization great is content. Um, content is the backbone of, of personalization. We, we are just delivering the right content based on, on different intents, right? But if you really think about it, content is what makes your customers fall in love with your brand. So, um, so we make that love story happen. Um, and, and a good way I always like to think about it is that if you go on a blind date and the date you are with ask you to marry, marry you, uh, before you have sat down at the uh, dinner table. That, that's super awkward, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the status quo uh, of, of how consumers interact with different sites today. We come in and it's all about um, get a sales demo, uh, buy this product, uh, sign up for newsletter. And, and we don't even know what is the brand all about. Uh, content mm -hmm. is, is what makes that love story, right? So if someone comes in for the first time uh, responding to a PPC campaign, it's not about get a sales call, sign up for newsletter, buy this product. It's about validation. It's about showing um, what your product or your services is all about. And then understanding in real time as the visitor starts to consume more content, here's the next step. Here, here's us going on the second date and here's us going uh, to be engaged and then eventually uh, get married and get the transaction, mm -hmm. which is now I'm ready to get a call for, for the uh, from the seller or buy this product. So. Content is really the um, the backbone. What we are doing with content is orchestrating it so it fits with the intent of the visitor and what states that they are in. So we are not trying to uh, to marry on the first date. Nicely said. I think uh, you know with with content, a lot of companies kind of just mostly create generalized content, but in 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 with personalization. Uh, and if it really works, uh, you can do some amazing things because then you can kind of get down to the intents, uh, create specialized content and just overall kind of just help, uh, you know, improve the experience uh, for the customer, uh, which eventually turn in, turns into uh, ROI for the company. Um, so great. Um, awesome, Lars. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks for uh, joining us uh, uh, for this talk. Yeah, thanks so much again for having me and um, yeah, have a great day and really nice chatting with you here. Thanks.